بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد فاتحة إن شاء الله This is going to be a summary of a course that I just taught at uh, Dada Tawfiq, which is, a, I guess, a branch at Sunni Path. And uh, interesting, uh, subhanAllah, I was making dua because I know that marriage is the foundation of, of the Islamic society. And it's very important for us to have uh, healthy, stable marriages in order to have a functioning society. So I was making dua, subhanAllah. And the day before the course started, Someone sent me this little, little, little booklet that's like half the size of the weird book, and it was called The Book of Intentions. It was written in Arabic, and it was by the, some Ahl al-Bayt uh, Shafi scholars from Yemen. And so when I read the intention about marriage, I said, oh, subhanAllah, <laughs> Allah answered my dua. And inshallah, when you hear it now, you'll understand what I mean. Um, this is two, two of the Alawi scholars. One is Muhammad ibn Alawi ad Aydrus. And it's a mixture of his and another one, um, the Sheikh al Araf Billah, Ali ibn Abi Bakr is Sakran. And these, these two, I mean, I took from both of these, what, are the, what is the intention of marriage? Okay, so these, you have to understand, these are great scholars. And what do they intend when they get married? Uh, he says, or they said, I intend by this marriage and this wife the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to obtain children in order to preserve humanity. And I intend the love of the Prophet sallallahu by providing him with more means to be proud. For verily he said, marry and reproduce For I am to proudly show you my ummah in front of the other nations on the day of judgment. Okay, so this is the opening general intention. And now we get to the details. I intend by this marriage and all my actions in word and deed to seek the blessing of the dua of righteous children. Okay, how do you have righteous children? The first thing in order to have righteous children is you have to have a happy, stable marriage. And so if you don't provide that for your children, the chances are you're not going to have righteous children. And so here, when the scholars are saying, we want righteous children, it means because one generation of righteous children will raise another generation of righteous children, will raise another generation of righteous children. So if you do your job properly, you're going to have several generations of people making dua for you. And if you don't do it properly, you're going to have several generations of people cursing you. And so, I mean, you should take your responsibility very seriously. So, what did he say? So, the blessing of the dua of righteous children and to seek intercession if one of them dies before me. And so, I mean, of course, having children, that's always, you know, a possibility that someone, you know, your child will die before you. And this is what most Muslims consider one of the greatest difficult empty hands. And so, because it's a possibility, the scholar is saying, if this happens, oh Allah, give me sabr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who have patience. And so, from the very beginning, all of this, you know, his direction is, how am I going to get reward? And how am I going to enter Jannah? Okay, so the next paragraph is, I intend by this marriage to protect myself from the shaitan. And a halal means for my physical needs. And a protection from evil to lower my gaze and minimize the suggestion of the shaitan. And so in marriage, obviously, this is the halal means of getting the needs that you, you, you have. And so... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the spouse, you know, you, you are a sukna for each other. And so the husband is the means of your halal needs, and the wife is the means of the husband's halal needs. I intend to preserve myself from indecency. 
needless to say, the number one addiction today in the West is pornography. So, I mean, this is what you're saying my intention is. And so the men need to know that if women realized how bad of addiction this is in the West, a lot of them wouldn't be getting married (laughs) because they're so disgusted with it. And so if someone's married a religious girl, then they should take themselves to task about being religious themselves. I intend by this marriage to find tranquility for myself and to keep company with my wife by looking at her and playing with her and to comfort my heart and strengthen it for worship. Okay, this is what a a great Sufi scholar is saying. This is what my intention is to do with my wife. You know, she's not a chair. She's not an instrument. But rather, she's a means of enjoyment and, and a way to draw closer to Allah. So your heart is at peace. And this is why our sheikh continually emphasizes the need of having a happy, stable marriage. Because when one has that base to move on, then they are really free to move towards Allah. And when they don't, it's like having car problems, something that bugs you 24-7. And so, you know, inshallah, let's go on to the next point and we'll see. So, I mean, so here, if men don't want to spend time with their wives and, and he is the halal means for her, then he should consider what's he doing. And also, this is for women who insist on every two months going to spend six months with their family. <laughs> okay. I mean, she, he didn't get married to be by himself. And so women, marriage is something that we, you know, it's mutually benefited, beneficial, inshallah. Okay. Uh, the next point here. Now, no, take note of this point because this is a Shafi scholar and we know that everyone is a Hanafi or wannabe. <laughs> oh, <yes>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so what is he saying? Because in the Hanafi method, the Shafi women are, it's not obligatory for them to clean the house. And so what is he saying his intention in marriage is? I intend to free my mind of the worry of housework, cooking and cleaning and maintaining my daily life. And so he's a scholar that's well aware that that's not her duty. But if he's intending to get this, this service out of marriage, women should understand that marriage is more than the bedroom. It is the kitchen and the living room also. And so if you don't want to do it, then don't get married. You know, many women say, well, it's not my fart. Well, you know, when they tell me it's not my fart to take care of him, I say, well, don't be upset if he finds another wife that will help you take care of him. <laughs> Okay, now let's go on and see what the scholars say about intending marriage. This is very important here. I intend by marriage, and this is both for men and women, to discipline my nafs through caring and guarding the rights of my family. Okay, let me read that one again. These are what the, you know, the great Sufi scholars Ahlillah, men of letter, knowledge of the letter, not only the spirit, say, I intend by marriage to discipline my nafs through caring and guarding the rights of my family. So what does the opposite mean? I intend not to abuse my family by letting my nafs go. And that's for both sides. Because the nafs, a marriage is the meeting of the nafs, his nafs and her nafs. And so when people let their nafs go, they often have an un-Islamic situation. And then what does he continue to say? If men want to know, I mean, often men ask me, what does it mean to be a man? I think this paragraph says it exactly if you want to know what the role of the man is. He goes, okay, I intend, for the third time, I intend by marriage to discipline my nafs through caring and guarding the rights of my family. Family here first means your wife, in case you're confused, for those who might think it's other than the wife. Okay, and to have patience with my wife's character, temperament, 
harm, as well as taking the responsibility of educating and guiding her to the right way, and to work hard to provide for her, to provide for my family a halal income. So these two sentences sum up what is partly what a man is in Islam. If any of you are wondering because you lack role models, this is what it is. And to supervise my wife in raising our children, not abandon my wife in raising my children, to supervise my wife in raising our children, our children. Okay? I mean, because a lot of women complain that, you know, they feel that they're left with this completely. And what happens that for men who do that, they're busy when they're young and they're sorry when they're old. And so these are, you know, if, these are wise advice by scholars. So if you take heed, you'll benefit. Okay, so to work hard to provide a halal income, to supervise my wife in raising our children, and asking Allah for his guidance to do so. And often these things are a learning process, and so it's an opportunity for both of you to turn to Allah to ask for guidance and how to have an Islamic family. And I ask for this success with neediness before him. I intend all of this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go on to say, I intend this and other than this in all my dealings, sayings, and actions in this marriage for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I intend with this marriage that which the righteous slaves and scholars have intended. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask those who know if you know not. Okay? So you give me a chance to hear what those who know are saying, what we intend when we get married. Oh Allah, give me success as you have given them. And help me as you have helped them. And complete my shortcomings and accept this from me. And don't leave me, us to ourselves even for a blink of an eye. Make good for us in all that we have asked in good and well-being from your goodness and generosity. O oh Allah, give me from you in this marriage and all my affairs help, blessing, and safety. And deliver me from being preoccupied from you, and that marriage will not come between me and obedience to you. And suffice, in, suffice me in this marriage and give me chastity. Okay, this point is, is really kind of like the, you know, what we call in Arab, Arabic the zubda, which means the, the cream of everything. Oh Allah. Protect me in this marriage that is not a source of disobedience between me and you. Because the problem with marriage or the blessing of marriage is that it's something, it's a type of worship that you do 24-7. And you don't feel it. And so either 24-7 you're pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you're displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the problem with that is that that can happen for one year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And you don't feel it. And it does you no good on the day of judgment to say, but our neighbors lived like that. And everyone else had a bad marriage. It's not going to do you any good. And so you have to know that when you choose to... We have something when we... I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that this... this Lesson is going to be short, so I can't go into the thick of a lot of the things. But there's something uh, 
in, 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 as a Muslim, we call this fardalin, ilm fardalin, which means knowledge that is personally obligatory. So once you decide to get married, you have to know the halal and haram and the, the, fiqh, the basic fiqh of zawaj wa talaq, marriage and divorce. But the most important you need think to, thing you need to know is that in marriage, Allah loves the righteous spouse. He loves the righteous husband and he loves the righteous wife. And there is nothing in that equation that says your spouse deserves it. You do it because that's what Allah loves. And if you don't want to do it, then get out of the marriage because you will be displeasing Allah 24-7 for years and years and years. And so take it seriously because it is a form of worship. And so someone is a good spouse primarily because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Allah loves the righteous wife and Allah loves the righteous husband. And it's a lot easier if your spouse is good and you love them. But even if you don't, if two people just behave like Muslims, they could have a decent marriage. A Muslim is kareem. A Muslim is honest. A Muslim is, you know, is, has ithar. He prefers his brother over him. And they don't say nasty things. Kalima tayyiba, sadaqa, kind words, is generosity. So if a person just had basic Islamic character and they didn't love the person they were married to, they could have a decent marriage, simply because you were a Muslim. Okay, let me finish the intention here. Um, okay, the last, I mean, that, that's the end of the intention, and then finally he, he says, well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives the blessing on the Prophet. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Okay, so I thought that was, uh, I thought that was amazing that I got that just the day before I offered the class. And so, I, and, and when I shared it with my husband, he just said, I don't think you need to do anything else. <laughs> if people just listened to that lecture or listened to the intention and understood it, there's not much more that needs to be said. Okay, so this is what marriage and faith have existed since the time of the Prophet Adam, salam, and will continue in the hereafter. So that's if you make it to the right place. <laughs> I think the ones in the wrong place won't be married. They won't have time. <laughs> okay. Um, this, uh, because you live in a non-Muslim country, I, I just wanted to mention this point uh, quickly, was that uh, often Muslim com- communities, when they find someone converting to Islam, they find it essential to marry them immediately. And that is very unwise. And you see these poor converts go through one or two or three marriages because of it. And so, as Muslims, you should feel obliged to protect these new Muslims and don't rush them into marriage. And what I advise most converts in most situations, I mean, there there will always be exceptions. I'm talking generally uh, that you should let her or him be a Muslim for a year. I mean, it's a big adjustment from coming from a non-Islamic life to an Islamic life. And so that, on top of a new marriage, is often too overwhelming. And also, for a new Muslim, the person that the community will push on you often wouldn't be who you would accept after a year of practicing Islam. It wouldn't be who you would accept after two or three years of practicing Islam. And so it's, ve- it's not fair to stick them with someone that no one else would be stuck with. And, and then they become serious about their deen, and, and, and they don't know how to get out of it because there's one or two children involved. And so as people that are religious in the community, you should take it upon yourself to protect new converts and advise them with sincerity. I mean, they're adults, and so they can make their own choices. But the right advice is wait. Learn Islam, live Islam, and then when the time is right, you know, you can choose someone. But who they choose today, believe me, is not who they'll choose after a year of practicing Islam. Okay. That was just a general advice I wanted to cover here. Just Okay, who should marry? Again, I'm not gonna, I don't have the opportunity to go through a lot of the thick of this, but I want to give it to you in a nutshell. It's obligatory or recommended or sunnah to marry for those who can provide for a wife and get married and have a need for marriage. But that's not what I'm concerned with. I'm concerned, and this is, of course, I mean, Obviously, I'm Hanafi, right? (laughs) So in the Hanafi method, I just want you to be aware that it is makruta harimi or haram for someone who knows they will be in jousts 
to their spouse to marry. And the Fukuha have said that if you are afraid of committing adultery, then that's a sin that you have to face Allah with. And that's not as bad as marrying someone and suppressing them. Allah hates suppression. Okay. Can you, can you take care of these for me just for a second? Okay. So Allah hates suppression. So I've seen women that are tyrant, tyrants, and I have seen men that are tyrants. And so you should take heed that according to the fuqaha, it is haram for you to get married until you fix up yourself. And so you should fix up yourself before you get in. Because getting married and being unjust to your spouse, you're getting on Allah's blacklist. And that should, you should be afraid of that more than anything else. Because Allah hates that you hurt one of his servants. And I'll tell you what Sayyidina Luqman said, the wise. Some people say he's a prophet, some people say not. Once I was at a tafsir class with Um Sahal, and he gave a list of 25 sayings. And one of the last ones was that the women come to you crying, and they are the tyrant. And so you should think about it. And today I find many of the women in marriages, the way they behave, it's tyrannical. You know, they're dying to get married, and once they get married, they become very abusive. And so you should fear Allah. And this also goes for men. Because the, the, na- the problem of the normal nature of marriage is that the man usually has the upper hand. And so someone with the upper hand, they're always prone to be tyrants. And so they should constantly be aware of that because Allah hates tyrancy and he has forbidden it for himself. <laughs>